To finish off the lists chapter, let's talk about another data structure that we could code up that is similar to lists, but gives us a little new functionality. And that is a partial map. So you might be familiar with this under the name map from other languages that you've used before. Dictionary is another common name. The idea is that there are keys and those have values that are bound to them. So that's like in a dictionary in the real world where the keys are the words and the values are the definitions of those words. But of course, in programming, we find all kinds of other use for dictionaries as well. In mathematics, the same notion is a map. Uh, that's a kind of map from an input to an output or from one domain to a codomain. And maps could be partial in the sense that not all of the keys could be bound, right? There could be some keys that have no binding in the map, just like there could be some words that don't exist in your dictionary. So let's introduce a data structure to represent that. We're going to build a inductive type called partial map. This is a type, and it has two constructors. One is going to be the empty map, which has no bindings for any keys. And the other is going to record a single binding. So we're recording here a binding of a key k to a value v. Now, for now, I am creating these partial maps only on natural numbers. Later on, we'll be able to expand them to work on other types of data as well in a later chapter. So this is a binding from key k to value v. And then, of course, there would other be other bindings in the map as well. So the rest of the bindings in the map are represented by this piece of data m, which is another partial map. So if you compare this definition to the definition of nat list, there are some similarities. We've got two constructors. We've got one constructor that represents the empty case. Uh, for lists, that was nil. And another constructor that represents something that has one more piece of data in it. Here I'm calling it binding. In the case of lists, it was called cons. And for cons with lists, that actually did recursively take in another list to represent the rest of the list. Just like here with partial map, we're recursively taking in another partial map. What's different with lists, though, is lists carried only one more piece of data here, which was the head element of the list. Whereas with a binding in a map, we're carrying two pieces of data, the key that's bound and the value to which it is bound. Let's implement a couple functions here. So we could define the update function. This updates the binding for a key in a map. If the key was already present, that's going to shadow the old binding. They're both going to be in it. We're not going to try to delete the old binding with this implementation, although you could imagine doing such an implementation. So to update the binding of key k to value v in an existing map m, we just record a binding of k to v, and the rest of the bindings will be whatever was already in m. Let's implement a find function as well to find what value a key is bound to in a map. Now, since these maps are partial, the key might not be bound, right? K might not, in fact, exist in that map M. So we're going to return a nat option here. This is another use of options to represent a kind of error case that a function could have, or the fact that a function is partial. So to find key K, what are we going to do? we match against m. If m is the empty map, then certainly k is not bound in it. So we can return none to indicate that error case. On the other hand, if there is a binding at the beginning of this map from some key, let's call it k2 here, it might or might not be the same as the key that was passed in, and that k2 is bound to value v, and the rest of the map is m prime. Well, then what we need to know is whether we just found the key or not, right? Did we just find k? So we will compare k to k2 using the e comparison operator we defined before of equality on natural numbers. If they are the same key, then we found it. Yay! We can return that binding. So there is a binding of k to v in this map, and we wrap it with sum to indicate this was a successful return as opposed to an error like none. Otherwise, well, this was not the binding of k that we just found, but there might be more bindings inside of m prime, right? It might or might not be empty. So we will recurse trying to find k inside of m prime. So that is our implementation of find for these partial maps. And now we could prove theorems about these. Let's prove a simple theorem about the relationship between find and update. If we update the binding of a key k to the value v inside of map m, and then go to find that same key k that we just updated, then we should get some v back. Right? This is expressing a property of the correctness of find and update. So to prove that, we can introduce m, k, and v. 
Now, if we simplify, that update operation is going to record a binding. And then because of that binding, the find operation is going to be able to do a comparison. So we've reduced two of those pattern matches right away. What we're left with is a comparison of key K to key K. Now, Koch can't immediately simplify that, right? That's an, a property of that piece of code of about equality that's not necessarily known because that equality comparison actually, if you remember, has to pattern match on its first argument. However, back in the induction chapter, we did prove a useful theorem, which is that eek b operator, that equality there that returns a bool on the natural numbers, is reflexive. So we can rewrite with that, and that simplifies the guard of the if expression to true, and therefore it's going to return some v. Now we've got some v on both sides, so reflexivity finishes that proof. There are many more interesting theorems we could prove about partial maps and other interesting functions we can implement on those. Later chapters of Software Foundations, uh, particularly in Volume 3, will do that.